All right. Precious Jesus, uh, I ask, Lord, that you would uh, amplify the words of this message. I ask, Lord, that you would put within me the, the fireball that was in me when I wrote this down in 2008. And now it's 2009 and finally seeing to preach it. But I ask, Lord, for your additional wisdom, clarity, anointing. Because of the nature of the topic, Lord, I ask that you would protect the listeners from hearing it incorrectly from the adversary trying to sneak in on anybody who's listening to misunderstand the intents and statements of this message. And at the same time, Lord, I pray that you would give us a, a light bulb, as it were, an aha, a hmm, to help us to consider these points and see, Lord, if that which is written isn't true, is true, is not valid, is valid, that we might do something with it. I bless your name. Thank you for this time. Amen. The title of this message, and it's actually going to end up being a short series, I don't know, maybe two, maybe three. Uh, I was going to try and do it all in one, but I have this feeling in my stomach it's never going to be done in one. <laughs> the title of this message is 50 Reasons why the church is powerless. 50 reasons why the church at large is powerless. This subject of the power of God in the church has been a somewhat of a lifelong pursuit for me. <clears throat> Ever since I discovered back in my Christian youth, as it were, my 20s, <laughs> that God had more available to me than what I had been getting in the Baptist church. That God had more available to the Christian than what I'd been hearing in typical messages. That God actually was interested in being involved in ways that uh, my new age, as it were, or occult background never told me. When I realized that God is not afraid to show himself, as it were, and that indeed we're in a battle over, as it were, from my point of view as a teenager, looking at the devil and looking at God and saying in our heart of hearts, which one of the two of you is more powerful anyway? It conceptually, when you're in philosophy classes, like I had attended in college, or in discussions in literary circles or whatever, you know, we talk about God a lot, we talk about the devil a lot, we talk about man a lot, we talk about these things. And the concepts get brought down to a real simple question. Well, if God is all-powerful, dot, dot, dot. Well, look, you can see evil's powerful, dot, dot, dot. And there's this thing when you talk to people, there's this uh, confusion. When you read, like, let's say, atheist books, there's a fuzz in people's mind when you talk to Christians even about God and the devil and who's stronger and what conceptually, the Christian will say, God is more powerful. And then we will say, in a sense, in our practice or our backdrop, uh, but evil seems to be winning. <laughs> <coughs> oh, please excuse me a moment, everybody. Sorry, should have been prepared for that. And so I've been on a, on a pursuit, um, both intellectually and in heart and in spirit, on the question of God's involvement. About uh, 1985, I started going down the road of wanting to seriously see the answer from God as to why the church is powerless. When I read the Bible... When I read certain ministers, when I receive things that I get from God, it sure seems to indicate that he really wants to dump his spirit on mankind. He wants to make certain things, as it were, commonplace. 
In the days of Jesus walking, it was commonplace. The healings were not onesie, twosie, 15% with relapse failures. They were, and he healed them all. It was done. And as I look at theology, philosophies, uh, uh, listen to those who oppose the gospel versus those who argue for the gospel, even those who have been in the gospel and gone to the other side and become now antagonists of the gospel, there's this, there's this rub in there. God isn't. Fill in the blank. God isn't. We conceptualize that he's powerful, and then we live powerlessly, or like I was listening on the radio the other day, uh, I could not believe this statement from this, this man of God. I know he's a man of God, but sometimes I really argue with him. Somebody called in and asked the question about resurrections in other countries that are going on. And after he got done with the him and the han and the theologizing and the logicizing and a few other things, he ended by saying this statement. He said, so I say to you, anybody who tells you these stories that resurrections are happening someplace, go check out the facts. If you will search it out diligently to find out the real person, place, and things, every, when you get down that road, you'll find it just evaporates. There is no such thing. It doesn't happen. And I'm thinking to myself, we just watched, <laughs> watched and listened to an entire testimony. And the man of God says, no, if you were to trace that down, truly do your investigative reporting, there wouldn't be anything there. And this was the final closing statement. So when I say I've been on this pursuit, I probably will be on it for all my entire life because we have fallen so short of the glory of God that it begs the question, why? And most of the times we don't ask that question. We happily are content to be in a powerless state. In fact, we even write um, theologies around the powerless state. We don't say like Paul, I did not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration. We say instead, we don't know if or when God will demonstrate or why he even demonstrates um, or as I read in a book just yesterday, uh, even prosperity. You know, God, yeah, sometimes will bless some people with great financial success. But we don't know why he does it. It's actually in the book, this book I'm reading. We don't know why he does it. It just seems to be special cases and he just does it. And that seems to be the overriding concept theology across the board on healings, miracles, prosperities, uh, uh, gifts, uh, every one of them that I trace down on, and all the way back down to the atheistic argument of, well, if God is love and God is all-powerful, then why hasn't he stopped war and why isn't he healing everybody and why hasn't he... It, and it, it, all these things funnel back down to really an argument that the atheists do use. They say either he doesn't exist, or if he does exist, he's powerless, or if he's not powerless, he's cruel because he's not given any of it to us to help out. And that argument distills down and it becomes a question of, of God's honor. Yesterday, as I, was, uh, as I was driving from one location to another, another I, I again spoke out loud, Lord, God, we need more advocates. We need advocates for God. Somebody who will stand up and defend God. We're so busy trying to defend the gospel, to defend the truth, defend our beliefs, defend our church, defend our reputation, defend our Christ image, doing all these things, while the real attack is against God, his character, his nature, and so forth. So this message is going to move around a little bit. So I know it's going to be, you know, got to kind of hang on to me because I'm, you know, jumping across cliffs here. It's not a systematic theological message laid out by scriptures in order like I oftentimes do. But it's the, think about this, stop on this for a minute. Look at your experiential background. Look at your Christian friend's background. Look at, and see if what I'm about to say is true. These are observations I wrote down in a flurry one day. Something pricked me. I don't remember what, partially don't remember. I don't remember part of it and I don't remember part of it. And as I've always said, when something pricks you and it starts to get you going, that's the time to put it down. And so I got pricked on this issue of powerlessness again. And uh, why does it 
why, 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 why? Is it God's fault? Is, is God just not playing? God says, I'm all powerful, but you don't get any of it. Uh, God is saying, I'm all sovereign, but uh, that means you guys just have to kind of muck around in the muck around for a while and then, mm, yep, yeah, zap. Okay. Is that what he's up to? Is that why the church is powerless and the world is without the testimony? Now, I'll flip it around on you for a second and borrow a line from Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew had a book titled, God Changed His Mind. It's a very good book. Brother Andrew drove Bibles across the Iron Curtain in his trunk of his car, piled with Bibles, when guards are standing there looking for no Bibles coming in. And he'd put, 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 put up, pray over the car, Lord, blind their eyes, in kind of a reverse Pauline method of, you know, blind the eyes of this person over here. They'd open the trunk, they'd see nothing, and they go through the gates, close, and then they go distribute their Bibles. Many of those Bibles I read somewhere, I don't remember where now, but I read somewhere that when the Iron Curtain fell, certain KGB, KGB uh, storehouses got opened up, and they found all those Bibles that they'd confiscated. They hadn't burned them all. They confiscated them. And they actually got distributed after the Iron Curtain fell. I went, you got to be kidding me. God put them in there in storehouses? So all the while we're thinking they're not getting distributed. Yeah, there's people that don't have their Bibles. They're baking it in their bread baskets and cooking in their ovens. You know, all the stories we hear about how people hang on to the Word. God just wasn't around to get those Bibles out there. And it really was a combination of I'm getting some to some, and I'm storing some in some places for the appointed time, for the release of the captives so that they have what they need. He really did that? And when I read that, just like I said a while ago, it's like, maybe he's more powerful than I think he is. Maybe he's smarter than we think he is. Maybe he's a little bit more clever in his strategies. But no matter what I do and what I see, it really comes back to the same thing. Why is the church powerless? Then the next thing you know, up pops another fella. This guy, Todd. Uh, what's his last name? Bentley. Bentley. Pops out of nowhere, doing these things happening in his services. The other side of the church fence starts writing books against him, exposing him, pointing at his marriage, pointing at his flaws, pointing at his, telling him he should step down, blah, blah, blah. I go to the bookstore, and there's two books he's written on, Power and Anointing, trying to help tell people, look, I was just, you know, I was in prison, and I did this, and I did that, and I didn't know, and, you know, seems to support just a sovereign grab anybody God wants to argument. And yet he's writing a book, trying to, two books, in fact, trying to explain to us how we can learn. Everybody who gets it, gets it, and then tries to teach everybody else to get it, and everybody else doesn't get it. Why? Is the church just being too pharisaical and, and, and putting a block up on the door so that nobody can enter into the kingdom? They don't enter in themselves, and, they're, and they, they won't let anybody else in either, like Jesus said to the Pharisees? Is that what we're doing? What kinds of things are affecting us? And so I wrote down 50 <coughs> reasons why the church is powerless that are probably not what you'd expect. I could say the church is powerless because it lacks faith. I could say the church is powerless because it lacks love. I could say the church is powerless because, you know, there's a number of canned answers that I could say. There might be a couple of them in here, too. There's so many of them here that I'm going to have to take them one at a time. But if I'm even 1% right, that's 1% of something we get to eliminate that might make us a little bit more yieldable, a little bit more available, maybe a little bit more sovereignly touchable. <laughs> the Bible is very clear. If you draw nigh to God, he is going to run away from you and not answer your prayers because he's sovereign and he doesn't care. Does that sound like the Bible to you? Okay, if we draw near to God, he's going to put it on a back corner queue and decide in, among the angels and Congress. And <laughs> we, we deal with God like we're dealing with a democracy. We deal with God like we're dealing with a uh, got to get into the queue of the printer, but there's 16 guys in front of me who've got their printing thing going first. The Bible says if you draw nigh to God, God draws nigh to you. What, so you two just can hang out? So the two of you can just kind of have a good time with goosebumps and feelings? 
I'm not trying to sound sarcastic. I suspect some people will take me as being sarcastic. What I'm trying to say is, as we even look at the reasons, but even before we look at the reasons, God's honor is under attack. And because it's under attack around us all the time, perhaps we inadvertently also hold him accountable. But what if it's nothing to do with him? What if it truly is, as I was reading in the intro of Charles Capps' book yesterday, and I know a lot of people don't like Charles Capps, but he said something. He said when he was early on as a farmer, and he started to get a hold of the, the scriptures a little bit, one day the Lord spoke to him and said, I said my people could have whatever they say was the first bing in the water of his mind that caused the ripple that started things. So he went and checked the verses, and he found the verse, and he said, it does. It says, whatsoever they say, not whatsoever they pray, not whatsoever they think. Other book I'm reading simultaneously at the same time says, uh, God, no, no, God says he only will meet our needs, not our wants. He doesn't meet wants. He only meets needs. He doesn't do what we say because that makes him our servant, and God is no servant to no man. You have to stop and go. Which man of God has lost his marbles? And now for a moment here, I'm being a little facetious there. I'm stepping back as a worldly person now. And as it were, I've just tuned through the channels of Christendom. You can have what you say. You can't have what you say. You can be healed. You can't be healed. There are resurrections. There are no resurrections. Why is the church powerless? I haven't a clue. Really, does that sound right? If the body's in contradiction with itself then we've got at least grounds to say that powerlessness might be partly predicated on we're confused, if I as an outsider are looking at the church. When I was working for Safeway, there was a guy there that worked with me that one day he wanted to be a lawyer and I was going to be a preacher. And he, we, we debated a few things back and forth, argued a few things, and he said, well, I'm going to do the law because... Until your God gets around to doing something, somebody down here has got to do something, and I can do that through the law. <laughs> so because you Christians are powerless, and criminals are running rampant, and evil is conquering the world, somebody's got to do something about it, I'm going to law. Law will take care of this. Somebody else says, I'll become a cop. Cops will take care of this. Somebody else says, I'm going to become a politician. Because if I was a politician, I could make policy, and I can change all this evil. Why so much human desire... Because something's missing, something's lacking, evil seems to be winning. Or to flip it around in the pursuit of my pursuit, <laughs> the pursuit of my pursuit, call it, why are we powerless? Would we need as many cops, as many lawyers, as many politicians, as many psychologists, as many psychics, as many astrologers, as many diviners, as many uh, people with opinions, as many educations, as many... How much of that won't we need when Jesus Christ returns simply because all of a sudden the ground rules are the way they should be instead of the way they are? Having said all that, I'll jump into the first one. Why is the church powerless? This one's going to offend some, I think. Maybe not you, but some. It struck me that one of the reasons the church is powerless is that it spends, and I'm going to use an overstatement on purpose, it spends all its time focusing on the law. Do's and don'ts. If you go and read the preponderance of, of, of character book, building books or solical building books or church bylaws or rules of engagement, as it were, for the church, or even as you listen to sermons that are being preached, there is a emphasis on law. Do's and don'ts. That was what I mean by that. Do's and don'ts. If... The Christian people would just do this or don't do that, then we would see something. 
I don't know what we'd see because they don't ever say what we'll see. They just simply say we're not seeing it because of. If all the Christians would stop doing this or start doing that, we worry a lot about obedience. Now, I'm not saying law is bad. Paul said the law is spiritual. And I'm going a step further and saying even man's laws have value. Respect magistrates. They're there to curtail evil. They're the messenger of God. But what happens when our focus becomes so um, narrow, uh, stuck, and we are focusing, that's why I use the word focusing, on law all the time. Are you powerless because you've been weighing your obediences? I didn't obey too good this week, so God can't use me. Guy, I really obeyed good this week. God's with me. I slipped and fell. When I was a young Christian, and I got saved by grace through faith, found out God loved me and all my sins were washed away. Why, I felt like I could do everything in God. How about you? You start out and it's like the rookies, we always say the new bees, seem to get more results sometimes than the old bees. Why? They start out and they just wash it all away. They no longer look at the law. They look at love. They look at grace. They look at mercy. They look God in the face and they go, wow. And then somebody comes along and says, and that's the adversary over there. And uh, you can go attack him now. You couldn't before because he had a, had a certain amount of authority over you because you were stuck in his kingdom. And you were in the darkness. You were in the world. But now you can go get him because God is on your side. And away they go. Away we all went. And then after a while, somehow, some way, excuse me, somehow, some way, we take our eyes away from the person of God, drawing nigh to God, moving God directionally, and we start, or others help us start, checking to see how well we're following the rules, the do's and the don'ts. The do's and the don'ts start taking such a preponderance of our mind time and our heart time because as we're growing in truth, we're trying to really understand the mechanism of God. We're trying to understand the mechanics of God, as it were. We're trying to understand how he does what he does and how we do what we do. And I think we, we sometimes formalize it, turn it into formulas and get in trouble. And sometimes because we see people turning it into formulas, we try to go totally non-formula and we get into trouble. But really what we're doing is we're weighing do's, don'ts, laws, obediences. Now what happens to a people who focus on their sins too much? Well, the only consequence of sin is death. Where, where does the gift of life come from then? It doesn't come from looking at the law. The people who chased after Paul that tried to bring people back under the law. Paul would go in and set people free, and the Judaizers would come in after he left town. Christians who had grabbed certain aspects of the law and would try to bring them back under the law. When Paul found out about it, he went, What? Why would you go back under that? You see, the law states very clearly, no man can be made perfect by the law. Well, I'm going to add one more piece to that. And no man, imperfect, can ever believe he's going to be used of God. Because there's always this doubt on the inside. You know the verse I'm always going after that says, Why do you look at us as though we by our holiness, our purity, I think it says in King James? Cast, uh, was able to heal this man. Why are you looking at us and weighing us as if to say, hmm, even in the world, a holy man is supposed to be what? I went to go see the holy man. Put him on a mountain and cross-legged, put him in a mat in the middle of a temple, put him in a, you know what I'm talking about, right? The holy man is all wise. The holy man is separated 100% from the world. The holy man is is perfect in his meditations, his surrenders, his 
whatevers. Or the holy man is the guy who 100% has poured himself out for everybody else but himself or herself. Care for the poor, feed the sick, take care of everybody else. And that's the person we believe then we should be listening to because they are so a model, perfect in obedience. But the church for all of its working on, its effort of struggle of do, do, doing the law or not doing the law, doing the do's and the don'ts, uh, looking at themselves in that perspective, have never healed one single person. If law, if obedience could have saved mankind, Christ would not have needed to come to Israel, and the Catholic Church would have been the glory of God on earth forever in the 1500s, when everybody if you stepped out of line, was stomped. We couldn't trust you with the Bible. We locked it up during the Middle Ages. Now we want to lock up the Spirit of God in the 2000s. Is there any difference in this? Why? Because we don't want to have wildfire. We don't want to see people sin. We don't want people to go into excess. We don't want people to mess up their marriages, mess up their houses, mess up their kids. We don't want it. One minister on the radio said, look at these revivals. They come in, they happen, and three years later, the church is a mess. It blew up. That's what revival gets you, a destroyed church. We, on the other hand, have strong churches we follow faithfully we do this and this and this and this and this and this we do this and this and this and we don't do this and this and this and we don't do this and this and we've been around for a long time therefore we must be right we pray we petition we meditate we listen and we're around but that over there looks awful volatile people reaching out trying to do things like that that seems awful volatile Look at our do's and don'ts. Look at their do's and don'ts. Every time I start looking down the cross, down the, the crosshairs of this gun, as it were, looking to shoot the power beast wherever he is, I'm going. That power beast seems so elusive, so unfindable, so unsearchable. Maybe God didn't want us to have any power. Maybe it was really all about get pummeled and survive and become Christ-like. Does the act of having power make us less Christ-like? Does the act of having the power of God flowing through us make us less Christ-like? More egotistical, less obedient, and let's just throw it, just leave it on the floor for a minute. Plunk, throw it on the floor. Look around in your experience and tell me whenever has a do or a don't given you power over your sins, over demons, over change. The Christian community, the religious right in addition, so called the moralist right, believe very much that we could change the face of politics. If we get the wrong people out and the right people in. Do you follow the law? Then I can trust you. Do you follow? The, do you believe in Christ? Then I can trust you. Hey, you said you believe in Christ, but you did that. Now I don't know if I can trust you. You said you don't believe in Christ, but you did the law. Hey, can I trust you? And then we take all that and mirror it back to ourselves. Somehow, some way, we're taking the law, the tablets and plus, and we're putting them in front of our face, and we are trying to put the power of God on display by holding up the tablets of stone. Now, I mean that both visually and practically. We do that with the book, too. We hold the Bible up sometimes almost like the tablets of stone. If you will just... Submit to this book, then your life will be different. Yes, it will. But the book says certain things. Is it the act of 
doing your Bible reading or not doing your Bible reading that's going to increase your relationship before God so that you, he can use you. If the do's and the don'ts is what's driving us and has been driving the church for so long, then where forth cometh these revivals out of people who know not better? <laughs> John Lake said he got tired of his relatives dying. That's what he says in his biography. Lost half his relatives to disease and death and said, this can't be right. I grab from all the men of God just for those who are listening on on video and other. You got to look at all the men of God, whether you like them or don't like them. You got to listen to all the testimonies about people who claim they've been to heaven, hell, or back and forth. You got to look at everything that the family has said. I'm talking Christ's family. And whether you agree with the family on every point or not, you got to start looking at it and going, what are they saying in common? What are they arguing over? I mean, you know, I didn't come from a family of, of uh, 16 kids, like my father supposedly mm -hmm. had, I think there were 16 kids. I always thought it was 11. My mom said 16. Can you imagine the arguments eight brothers at the dinner table were having over stuff? You know, two took the conservative, three took the liberal, two took the abstain. I don't know, but you get my point. You have to look at the men of God for what they say. They say, the Bible says, I say, okay, let me see if the Bible says that. They say, I was in prayer and the Lord spoke to my heart and here's what he said. And I went off and did it and lo and behold. <laughs> but the do's and the don'ts. <laughs> the do's and the don'ts are um, working us over. I think when the church gets to the place where law gets subsetted to Christ correctly, the glory of God will be a lot easier. Paul had the law in correct relationship to the Spirit, and he called those spiritual laws. That means there's coding above the coding that makes us function correctly. I was reading a, a, a piece of a book this week, uh, written by a guy back in the 50s, who was trying to apply science to reality, business reality, economics. And he made a statement. He said, science teaches that there are these laws, functions. And he was trying to extrapolate that into the solical realm and beyond. But he was trying to extrapolate. He said, God, without saying it, God put order in the universe. And he said, if you don't bring yourself in line with that order, you cannot get the product of that order. And I took what he said, and I thought about that for a minute, and I thought, let's, let's transmute his ideas for a minute, because he's taking God out of the picture when he says it the way he says it. Science has kind of become God. But take that out for a minute and look at it from a different point of view. If God says to you, do A, B, C, D, and E is the result, that's a law. But it's not a law of do's and don'ts. It's a law of how things operate. Faith plus patience plus this plus this gets this. But we're looking at our do's and don'ts. We're not looking at the equations. We're not looking at the law that God laid down of his operation and how he does things. We make him so outside of the process that we actually believe we don't have any true say in the process. And yet Christ, oops, sorry, Christ didn't say, I did all this because I'm perfect in the law. And yet we say of Christ, well, the reason he was able to walk on water is because he was God, yea, verily God, or we say it's because he was perfect, or we say it's because he was sinless, or we say because God was with him because he was perfect because he was sinless. But don't you go trying to walk on water. You try to walk on water, you're going to drown. Well, but Peter walked on water. Was Peter perfect? Was Peter sinless? Was P had Peter fulfilled all the law? No, he said, I'm so much a sinner, I don't even want you in my boat. And Jesus goes, hmm, I like your attitude. <laughs> I think I'll use you as an apostle. How about that for criteria for picking our apostles in our church? First guy that walks in the door, first gal that walks into the door that admits that they are 100% a sinner and they can't do it at all by themselves, 
Come on, you're on the board of directors. But we don't do that, do we? We measure by the do's and don'ts. And then that's what we're stuck in. We don't go beyond the do's and don'ts. One last thing on the do's and don'ts. And who knows, I may try to re-preach this message again another way. Because I feel like it could be like a facet of a diamond that hit from five or six different directions. But it may not be so much that the do's and the don'ts are stopping us as it is that our reaction to the do's and the don'ts are stopping us. We don't do that here. We have rules about that. So a guy goes out and he says, well, then I guess I'm leaving this corner of the universe and going to do it over there. Then after a while, he's been successful, raised up a ministry, and he's now writing his own rules of do's and don'ts. To protect from evil, we write laws. But notice how I said that. We protect from evil by writing laws. But how do you overcome evil? Do you overcome evil by writing laws? You overcome evil by making prisons. What I mean by that is this. The devil is running to and fro as a lion seeking whom he may devour. As long as I can cage him, that's good enough, right? As long as I can lock the demon, as it were, up in a corner. By me not submitting to him. By me controlling my flesh, my obediences, my nature. I thereby have locked up the evil. And as long as it stays locked up, I'm okay. It cannot harm me anymore, right? Well, the problem is we find out that 20 years later, somebody broke the lock. And out comes this beast. And we're back in the do's and don'ts flip again. If the church is powerless in relationship to the law, it is a focus problem for sure. It is a naivety naivety as it were because somehow we're saying of the law you can save us somehow we're looking at it and saying you can empower me or if not empower me you can at least get me out of the way so that i can be empowered whereas christ said follow me and i'll put my authority on you and i'll go and do authority even authority is, in this world is, is predicated on, we don't want to give you authority unless you've somehow demonstrated yourself to be um, all wise, all knowing. Uh, I got to know that your skill set matches leadership. And yet what's ironic about that is in a true war, when people are down on the ground and people are dying, people get promoted to lieutenant awful quick in field duty because hey, okay, you don't, know, you don't know one thing from another, but you got three things going for you, kid. You save everybody you get your hands on. You pound the enemy back every time he turns around. You lead the ones who collapse in the middle of the trial. You know, because in war, you, people get very scared. Grown men cry like little boys. Because in a war, it gets tough. You know, you don't know what your emotions are going to do. The field promotion is not based on how well you performed your military responsibilities. Did you shine your shoes right today, soldier? Did you make sure your bed was in order, soldier? Out in the mud hole of the, of the battlefield, the do's and the don'ts sometimes just evaporate. Now, if you violate the do's and don'ts the wrong way out on the battlefield, you can be hauled up for a court-martial upon return home. It's not a free-for-all, chaos rules, don't pay attention to the do's and don'ts. Paul never said, don't pay attention to the do's and don'ts. What he said was, it was supposed to lead you to Christ and get you to start behaving like Christ. Put on Christ. It doesn't say put on obedience, perfection before the law. Number two. Well, I'm not going to number, I'm just going to say next one. I don't have numbers next to them, but it is number two. And as you can see, this is going to be a long series. But it's because I'm not trying to just give you the laws and say, here's the laws, go think about them. I'm trying to, in my own attempt even, and get it on record in the process, put out there this 
massaging. And I want you to take the massaging and go look at it. Pay attention to it. We need more of the power of God in the church. And large. I wrote this down. Why is the church powerless? It spends all of its time focusing on the soul character of man instead of in pursuing God who creates character. Let me see if I can verbalize that in a picture. I have a box of 100 puzzle piece box called Anthony. Hi, my name is Anthony. I am a puzzle. Now all the pieces are all over the floor. Would somebody please put my character back together? See, Brother John over there, his puzzle's put together. Man's got character. The guy over there has been in, in uh, uh, the monastery for 50 years, and he's got his character together. I look around and I say, look at all these. But the thing here is, the sole character of man, as we're working out the puzzle of the character... Again, throw the qualifier, character issues aren't bad. But as we're working on that, we are focusing on us. We are focusing on the church. Let me put it to you a different way. If the body of Christ could be represented as a bookstore, <laughs> talking Jesus Christ like the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had a head of silver and gold and brass and feet of this and that, right? Now picture Christ for a moment, and he's represented by the book titles and sections we have. Well, this is the uh, apologetics section of God, right here. Christ, I meant to say. And uh, this arm here is the apocalyptic revelatory piece. Well, no, actually, we've been trimming that back recently. So the, the, that part of the, 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 the base is, you know, back to here. Yeah, I don't know, maybe here. No, no, that's the power of God. We, we already know this is the power of God because Christ said, this, if I by the finger of God cast out, you have seen the kingdom of heaven. This is the power of God. If you could visualize Christ as a statue and just start taking the labels off of bookshelves. I know, it's a weird way of looking at it, but it works for me. If the bookstore could transform her into Christ. <laughs> How would you like that one? What, what would his statue look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It's about this tall, and it's full of character. Sure, we want people who have good character. Sure, we want people who are righteous and honest and decent and full of integrity and all that. Sure, we want great marriages, great kids, great families, great... Because that's great. But while we're putting the puzzle piece called Anthony together, while we're putting the puzzle piece called you together, while we're putting the grand puzzle piece call, uh, category of the church, our church, our little church, corner of the universe church, as we're putting it all together, all the while we're working on that, we are not petitioning God for anything of what he's doing. We are spending our time focusing on character. <clears throat> now, I'm going to say that my next sentence is what I believe to be a tragedy, but others believe to be wisdom. You got a man of God who is highly gifted. Highly. Been gifted for 50 years. Comes up with a weakness. Character weakness. Solution? Bench him. Why? Because we know that more important than all of the manifestations of God, character is the most important thing we should be working on. It is not good for the testimony. It is not good for the man. It is not good for us. If that man of God, who everybody looks up to, turns out to have this single stripe problem, we should mention because until the character's in line, the power shouldn't flow. That's the logic, whether you realize it or not. Why? Because if I can say it this way, when the light bulb of power's on, bzz, it draws. But then when those people come near this person, male, female, child, whatever, and they look and they see the flaw, oh my God, we could have sin in the church. And we do know what Paul said about that guy with his mother. Book of Corinthians. You know, we know what he said. Out with you. Excommunicate him. I just heard that preached on the Catholic Channel last week. 
Excommunication is the method by which blah 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 we purify the church. He, uh, mm, maybe, maybe it purifies the church. Maybe it doesn't. If the character of a human being is in the way, is God not able to say, "Hey, you woodshed with me"? Or maybe he just uses them more, so they don't got time to mess up. Hmm, ever thought about that? If you have a child, and the child is always making certain mistakes, correct, 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 is one way to deal with them. You're busted, you're busted, you're busted, you're busted, you're busted, is a way to deal with them. You're on restriction, you're on restriction, you're, right? That's a way to deal with them. There is another way to deal with them. Make them busy. They don't have time to make that. They're busy. You know, uh, the old world school, old school world way of, you know, idle hands are the devil's work. A lot of character changes take place in people who just are doing. Um, there are probably things in your life, I'm sure there are things in my life, that if I could replace item X with item Y, X would just go away. Whatever X might be. But I think the issue on powerlessness, as I've been watching it over the years, is we are getting to the place where we are imbibing a certain kind of humanism. And that humanism says, when I am made perfect, then Christ can come. When I am not in the way, or more importantly, when I'm in the right way, then Christ can come. But Christ didn't come initially because we made ourselves well. He came because we said, I am a sinner, have mercy upon me, and beat ourselves on the breast. We did not say, at least I'm not like that guy. We came in begging, requesting, petitioning. And God worked on the character part. So I said, instead of pursuing God, who creates character. We are so scientific in this country, in this generation. Everything's being boiled down to a science. Now we've got to figure out what DNA made you do that. Before, we had to figure out what your psychosis was and see if we could electrocute it out of your brain. Before that, we get, took you to the local witch doctor and just saw, you know, I'm being a little facetious. <laughs> you know, we, we're always coming up with a scientific method to make you better. Whether it's spiritual, psycho, psychosomatic scientific method or it's whether it's the physics scientific method or, or the new age, now you got to get into the ether method or whether it's, we're always trying to make you better. And again, I didn't say not being better isn't good. But for all the making better we have done for over 200 years now, it hasn't started one revival. It did not bring the infilling of the Holy Ghost in. It's not what brought it in. It is not what has ever produced a single healing. In fact, the test on character often comes after the power of God arrives. <laughs> God almost seems to say, I'm going to use you to the best of your ability <laughs> for the number of years I can use you in to the yield ability and your character issues, we'll deal with them. I wish I had a, 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 the right word for this one because when I say it in my mind, when I hear it in my heart, it's like, yeah, but you're saying character's bad to work on, and it's not. But if you're going to have the power of God flowing through you, you're going to have joy. And that might change your character of depression, I suppose you could call it. The power of God drives out demons. While we're working on character, demons are sitting there going, I'll wait. Then we stop working on character because, of course, we can't beat ourselves, work ourselves to death anymore. And then they try to relaunch an offensive again. The power of God flowing through the church never originated with the character of man that I can see. But it certainly can be... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, 
the valve of his ability to flow through does seem to fall in categories like verses of the fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. But then see, they take that righteous to say, meaning your character again. So until you get your character in order, the prayers won't be answered. In essence, that's where the arguments go. But even that verse, which is talking about a prophet under the Old Testament, he was not justified by his sacrifices. So his character becomes what we look at and say, it must be because he was really a righteous dude. And that's why. Or... It could be very much that he just leaned heavily on the hev heavily on the heavenly Father for everything, and God counted it to him for righteousness, like Abraham. Let me impute some righteousness on you. Now be fervent in it, okay? Moses by no means did things everything right after he was Moses. <laughs> Being a little facetious there. Before that, he was Pharaoh's son. Paul by no means did everything right in his character for that that he manifested so much. He even said, oops, slapped you. Didn't mean to. But nevertheless, <laughs> if we are focusing on one thing, I think we're starting to deny other things. If we look at God in the face and say, fashion my character, he is more than willing to do that. If we are fashioning our character and hoping to present ourselves before God for usability, whether on an individual scale or a corporate scale, I think that plugs the flow of God's power. Some people say that, um, I'm kind of sh half shifting to the next point. Some people say that, that God cannot abide the presence of sin therefore he must withdraw and so that's why the power isn't flowing the way it should be because right now he can't intermingle with us but the problem is if that were true then the sacrifice of christ is pointless because all power has been given to me go ye therefore becomes no longer a viable statement because I can only give it to you if you are better character. It bothers certain individuals on, on, the, on the radio when they see imperfect people being used in God's power. They immediately must somehow say in their hearts, no, it's not happening, it can't be happening, look at your life, you're a mess. Therefore, I will question every miracle you claim happened. I will test every verse you say you're standing on. I will speak against you. And they basically do it from that platform. They will get their constituents not to listen because so-and-so has said this wrong or done this wrong or their character isn't quite right. It's interesting that Luther's argument up against the Catholic prelates was convince me by scripture, convince me by reason, or convince me by conscience. If there was ever somebody who should have said convince me by character, he could have certainly thrown that at the priests. Luther's whole revelation, the just shall live by their faith, was in direct opposition to, as it were, the just shall live by their <clears throat> what works. There would have been no Lutheran revival if that truth hadn't badgered its way into a system that was so heavily works-oriented. Every time we look at character, we in essence echo back to my first statement about looking at laws of do's and don'ts. Integrity, yes, good thing, honor, truth, justice in the American way. Oh, sorry. I'm Superman. Yee no, you're not. You're mortal. You're failed. You're frail. You failed. You're frail. You failed. You're frail. <laughs> How then can the power flow back into the church? Well, should we just disregard character? Are you telling me I should just disregard it? Just let everybody do whatever they want and that somehow is going to let God's power come through? 
No, because the antithesis is too far of a step the other direction too. The issue becomes the puzzle piece of Anthony, as it were, has to be put together and finished. God is the author and finisher of me as much as he is the author and finisher of my faith. But what's my faith in? Me, my character, you, your character, my perfect church, the perfect church across the street? Do you know there are people hopping from church to church to church looking for the minister who doesn't have a flaw? They say, man of God. Oh, do you know what I found out this week? Woman of God. Oh, do you know what I found out this week? I quote somebody to somebody and they go, yeah, but do you know what they said on such and such? I got it from so-and-so that they said such and such. Do you really follow somebody who says something like that? I go, look at the 52 things he said right. Do you see those are right? Yeah, but I don't know if we can follow somebody whose character is not quite right and his words aren't quite right. And this person isn't quite right. We're supposed to follow persons of good repute and good this and that. Fine, follow them. But how about following also the ones who are pursuing God in a veritable chase, who with violence, as it were, are taking the kingdom by force. They don't care that they are the Amarez Jew and they're just frail and weak. They are going to come and stick their hand on the hem of Christ's garment and they're going to say, my character, my person, my all of that is irrelevant. I'm dying. I need to touch him. Doesn't mean God ain't going to work on character. But I think the pursuing is part of the issue here. I think that we have too much time, this is the third point woven in here, too much time worrying about the sin instead of about the law of mercy and grace. That's a law too, mercy and grace and forgiveness. That is a law of God operating higher than obediences because that puts the onus, as it were, the responsibility, the focus on him who's perfecting us instead of us who are perfecting us for him. If he is going to keep forgiving me, and I'm forgiving 270 times in a day, and he's forgiving me 270 times in a day, in about three years, I'm not going to have this problem anymore because it's just going to go away. And if I learn a few other things he's taught me, uh, deliverance, spiritual warfare, all the things he's tried to give me a, a benefit, and I do it and I do it and I do it and I do it because I'm pursuing him, what then? Have you not succeeded in changing everything you wanted to change anyway? Because you're going after the law of mercy and grace. I'm not saying, you know, the, you know, the uh, old cliche, sloppy agape, as people call it. Um, there are those who oppose any idea. The heavier you preach mercy and grace, the more nervous they get. Because they think it's license. They think it's denial. They think it's letting you get off scot-free without being judged for what you did right, wrong, or different. But there's another side to it that says, even a criminal in jail... Serving his time. How's he going to survive that? By being more perfect in jail? No, he's going to survive that by leaning on mercy and grace. He's going to lean on goodness somewhere. He's going to pursue it. A lot of people give their life to Christ in jail. You know? Okay, we're almost done here. Go ahead. The bottom line of it here is that the law of mercy and grace overcomes the law of sin and death. And in so doing, puts our mind in the right place and our hearts in the right place to receive the power of God. When I look around at the church, their focus is elsewhere and the results are elsewhere. For the few people who seem to bust through the barrier, they just go, hey man, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. And I can deliver that to you if you'll listen to me. And they're done. If we could move more that direction as a church universal, but starting here with us church independence, little guys, I think that God's already got a lot of power waiting for our purposes. It's just our persistence that's the problem in this area. We stop short of the glory of God. We're literally falling short. We're tripping just before we get to that mark. 
I'm going to stop the message there and we'll continue it next time or the time after, depending on how the Lord moves me. Jesus, thank you for this message. Amen.